And we could see a completely different team a year from now. And blowing it up and changing coaches and changing star quarterbacks. I'm sort of surmising that the Cowboys are in this mode where we'll see. You're tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, 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 yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It's a Wisdom Wednesday, presented, of course, as always, by DraftKings. You know, that's one way you can always get in to the best ball draft that we're having on the Fantasy Feast podcast. Going to announce a couple more entrants today on the show. So make sure you're listening to today's Fantasy Feast podcast. Or you can watch it, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Same place you can watch us here, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL on social. We're at Ross Tucker Pod. Some interesting stadium news. Good day, by the way. For the wisdom to be coming to us from our guy, Andrew Brandt. Let's get right into it. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Well, we like to do this every once in a while. Get together with my colleague on the DK Network and Ross Tucker Podcast Network. Used to be a weekly guest, which was incredible. But now I kind of get my fill a lot just by listening to the Business of Sports podcast, where a lot of you hear us right now. We're doing our our crossover simulcast. Of course, I'm talking about Andrew Brandt, the longtime NFL executive. And, of course, he also writes. And he was once on the other side of the table as an agent as well. So many of you listening right now and checking us out on the Business of Sports podcast. I think most of you probably know I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years. Love picking Andrew's brain. And so we're doing a simulcast between the Business of Sports podcast and the Ross Tucker football podcast here on a Wisdom Wednesday because it's been too long and there are a lot of topics to get to with Andrew. In fact, I'm not even sure Andrew... We'll have enough time to get to all the topics I want to get to with you. Great to see you. I know a lot of people will check us out, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's funny, Andrew, because I've been wanting to get have you on, and we've been wanting to talk to each other for a while anyway. And then there's big Packers news this week with Ed Policy being named the next chairman and CEO. That does not happen very often in Packerville, Andrew. It doesn't. Great to be with you, Ross. We have been angling towards this for a while. I want to ask you some questions, too, as we do this simultaneously with the Business of Sports pod and the Ross Tucker pod. Here we are together again. Um, Yeah, I'm in my son's apartment. There's his uh, stock (laughs) on the wall. He's an owner. And so he's invited, and all Packers stockholders are invited July 25th to go to that meeting in next month. Uh, and what this is is really unique, obviously, as everyone knows. When you go to an NFL meeting, Ross, sometimes the commissioner, whether it was Paul Tagliabue or Roger Goodell, would say, okay, we're going to go to a one-per-club session. And that means guys like me are kicked out, and it's one per club. It was... 31 owners and the Packers president. So that was who was in the room in the one per club, the most exclusive NFL owners meeting. This is the person that represents the Packers in league governance. This is the person that represents the Packers in any vote that the NFL takes. And of course, oversees the operation in Green Bay. It's a big news. Um, I'll get to Ed in a minute. I do think that The important thing people should know is that Packers have a structure where it's a real difference to football, and I don't think that is changing. So Ed Policy is the general counsel of the Green Bay Packers as we sit here today. He'll ascend on July 2025. But, you know, I was general counsel too, Ross, but my role was football general counsel. So I did every player contract, negotiated Uh, managed our salary cap, dealt with player issues, player grievances, injuries, disputes, things like that, replaced by a guy named Russ Ball. 
policy is more like the council that dealt with or deals with local politics, sponsorship and licensing, Lambo Stadium issues, real estate, title town, sort of a more corporate council point of view. And I bring that up to say that, again, the Packers are not picking any kind of quote unquote football person to be their president CEO, which tells me it will continue to be a football first uh, autonomy there. In other words, whether it was Ron Wolf, Ted Thompson, and now Brian Gutekunst, they all have great autonomy to do what they need to do and want to do for the football operation. I don't think Bob Harlan, Mark Murphy, Ed Policy has or will interfere with the football operation. They come from a different background, an administrative corporate business background. So I don't think a lot's going to change in sort of how the Packers operate with this new change. So that's interesting, too, um, is just the, the process by which they pick this person. Can you refresh my memory on sort of, I know the Packers have a board, but how do they decide who's on the board? Is that where the fans or the owners, I guess, vote? Like I, That's the part I'm curious about. I know it's publicly owned, but how do they determine those board seats if that's the, the organization that's essentially running the team? Well, there's a board of directors and there's an executive committee. The board of directors meets quarterly. And I remember those meetings, Ross, I would present the cap and our contract and our finance situation and pretty much rubber stamp. They'd ask a few questions to the general manager and those board meetings were kind of perfunctory every quarter. More importantly is the executive committee. Now, these can be a bunch of Green Bay or greater Wisconsin business people, leaders. Bud Selig was on the board for a while on the executive committee. So this kind of thing happens, and they're kind of the governance over the Packers, and they were involved in the search firm to pick the president to replace Mark Murphy. Uh, here's full disclosure. I went through this in 2008, and I was a candidate with Mark Murphy. Mark Murphy went and obviously got that position. Um, I was not a candidate this time. I did not want to throw my hat in the ring. I've moved on from that. I had a great time being with the Packers for almost 10 years, and it was a chapter. It was a chapter of my career, one that I don't want to revisit at any time in terms of going back. But what happens, you have the board of directors, which again is below the executive committee, and the executive committee with a search firm picked the new president. And it's good timing as well, Andrew, because there have been quarterbacks getting paid, the most recent being trevor lawrence and so there are people out there that believe the next most likely quarterback to get paid will be jordan love who had done a really interesting contract a year ago knowing that he was you know on the precipice of the the fifth year contract uh, the fifth year option i guess i'm just curious about your thoughts andrew on what we've seen from the quarterback market in general and sort of what you're expecting for Jordan Love? Yeah, let me talk quickly, Ross, about Lawrence. I think the deal was overblown. Obviously, the numbers are there. They put out the big number. But I did an anal analysis of the Lawrence contracts. Not that good. I mean, in terms of the way I evaluate contracts, which is forget about cap, forget about total number. What's the cash? What's the cold, hard number he's taking home every week, every year? And Lawrence, among all these recent quarterbacks like Jalen Hurts and Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert and and Lamar Jackson um, and Kirk Cousins and Dak Prescott, it was the worst, the lowest of first-year cash, two-year cash, three-year cash, four-year cash. Lawrence is the lowest. So again, don't believe everything you read about these numbers. With Jordan Love, I, unfortunately for the Packers, they don't have a lot of wiggle room. They've got to meet that market. Now, if the market is 55 a year for the extension years, Jordan Love only has the one year left, which will make him better situated than, say, Trevor Lawrence or Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert that had two years left before the extension. So I think he's going to meet the market. The challenge will be for the Packers is the guarantees because thanks to a guy named Andrew Brandt, <laughs> they don't guarantee past one year. 
that's always been the policy in Green Bay. That's going to be hard to structure. It's going to be a huge number for Love in year one, 2024. And they're going to have to figure out the structure beyond that. So I think it'll get done. I think the extension years will rival exactly what Joe Burrow and Trevor Lawrence got. And I think it's going to be interesting structure with probably option bonuses going forward in the future. Um, the tougher ones, Ross, I think are going to be Tua uh, because I don't know how the Dolphins feel about Tua in terms of re renegotiating or letting it ride. And the same thing with Prescott. Prescott's got an onerous number, but they haven't really, as far as I know, engaged in deep negotiations. So I think Prescott, again, like Tua, we may see that just go to the end. And they don't do a deal before this year and they play it out. I'm not sure I understand the Cowboys strategy these days, and, and maybe you don't either. But I guess before I even dive into that, Andrew, why is no guaranteed money past the first year? Why is that so important to the Packers? Or maybe since you're the person that did it, why was it so important to you? The way we looked at deals or the way I looked at deals in negotiating player contracts was not so much how much money is going out, but what's our downside risk? So what happens if the player goes south? And the player can go south for a couple different ways. One, there's a character issue. We don't want to continue the contract. Or two, there's a skill issue. Where are these downturn in performance after signing the contract and we look to get out? Um, so we look at what's the guarantee left because cap you can always deal with. Cap is something that's just accounting. Cap's not real money. It's just accounting purposes. Dead money is not real money. So we tried to structure things that way. And with that, you had to come up with ways for your superstar players to compensate them without getting into guarantee issues. So what does that mean? That means you give a big signing bonus. You give a big number in the first year, fully guaranteed, of course. No one's worried about the player playing out the first year of his contract. But by year two, three, four, you're not guaranteeing the money. What you may have, and you've heard about these deals, Ross, is an option. So an option's not guaranteed at signing. But if you get to a point in the contract, it could be year two, could be year three, year four, the remaining portion depending on what the option says, becomes guaranteed. So what you have with other teams is at signing, you have years one and two, maybe part of year three guaranteed. Maybe some teams, all three, the first year is guaranteed. And of course, Deshaun Watson, all five years. But the Packers have year one guaranteed, and then everything else is kind of on the come. And again, you're protecting downside risk if somehow the player doesn't turn out to be what you thought he was going to be. You know, you got to compensate podcast hosts sometimes too, Andrew, and the way we do it, by telling you about Labatt Blue Light. Drink Labatt Blue Lights with your friends. Live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly. Beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. What do you make of the Cowboys strategy, Andrew? Because it's not just Dak. It's CeeDee Lamb. It's Micah Parsons. I mean, they've got core players that – they could and or should be extending, but they're not. Well, I thought Prescott Dak did the best contract of the young quarterbacks because of its length. It's only four years. So he did four years, 160, 40 million a year was the big number at that point three years ago. So we've seen how the quarterback market has ascended beyond that. Um, but the fourth year has really strapped the Cowboys. So it puts them in a bind because of the big number, because they've redone it, so they have a cap number that's huge this year. They could redo it, but if they redo it, they're locking themselves into Prescott for more years at a much higher number. The other thing is they let it go, and then he's a free agent, then they're getting into franchise tag stuff that they did last time, or maybe just let him go into the market. So it's very strange because as you said, the way they get cap room to address Micah Parsons, to address C.D. Lamb, is through the Prescott contract. But the Prescott contract has no remaining years, so you can't just convert the big salary to signing bonus because the deal's over this year. So he's got them over a barrel. I've said that Prescott has the most leverage of any, any player in the league. 
I don't know what your thought is. I want to, I'm curious as to your thought. My thought is having been at the game in Dallas where the Packers rolled over the Cowboys in the playoffs, I thought Mike McCarthy would get fired. He didn't. He's in his last year. Prescott's in his last year. Lamb's in his last year. Parsons is in his last year. Maybe we're looking at a play it out year on all those four with the Cowboys as they decide where's the next move. And we could see a completely different team a year from now and blowing it up and changing coaches and changing star quarterbacks. So I'm, I'm sort of surmising that the Cowboys are in this mode where we'll see. What do you think? It's a very interesting point because Jerry Jones has said a number of times he likes options. He likes playing option quarterback. He's played option quarterback his whole life. So I think what he's saying is I think he does want to let it play it out. I think he does want to see how things go this year. And if he has to pay Dak more as a result of it, he's willing to do that as that will be his choice at that point. But I think it'll be worth it to him to pay him the more to Dak at that point if he feels good about it and and, and that feels like Dak has earned it with another year of playing at a really high level. I, I think you you make a good point because maybe if they brought in a new coach after this year, they would want to go young at quarterback. So I think that they just – they want to give themselves options and they're trying not to get locked into things with these guys. I mean, I would imagine the thing I don't understand about that is like, no matter what you do at quarterback or head coach, you're going to want Micah Parsons there. Yeah, You're, you're going to want CD lamb there. And maybe they just can't do it because of Dak's cap number. The optionality is a great point because it all relates to Dak. And it all comes back to Dak because of the, the cap and they've gotten overextended on that contract. Yeah, I mean, the way, as I said, the way to create cap room to address Micah Parsons and C.D. Lamb is Dak Prescott. For whatever reason, they're not doing it. And I think like you, they want optionality at that position. And if they don't, Ross, if they don't do the contract, I'm guessing there's going to be no tag. I'm guessing they're going to let him go to the market or sign him to a massive new deal. I don't think they're going to play the tag game next year. It just seems like that's a way they already went with Prescott. They're not going to do it again. So that's the most interesting player to watch in terms of contracts over the next year. I know we've talked about this before, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts on Charlotte City Council you know, voting and approving the $800 million stadium renovations to Bank of America Stadium for the Carolina Panthers. We've talked about it before in the context of other franchises, but now uh, the worst team in the league with an owner who's not very popular <laughs> has been able to secure not a, new, not a new stadium, but a lot of public funding. You know, what a night for Monday night with the team named Panthers. The Panthers won the NHL, and the Panthers of the NFL got $650 million stadium subsidy for their own renovations. Uh, you know what I say all the time, Ross. Socialized costs, privatized profit. It's an incredible strategy for NFL owners. Uh, the Charlotte City Council voted 7-3 to three to give this $650 million to the Panthers for their stadium renovation. Of this, there's another 150 million coming from ownership. But again, David Pepper, popular or not, one of the richest men in the NFL, a net worth over 20 billion dollars, and he's getting 650 million dollars from public funding. To be clear, this did not go to a referendum. This is not a vote. This is not taxpayer. It is the city council which will release funds through some kind of funding from hospitality taxes in order to satisfy the Charlotte Carolina Panthers. Why does this happen? Why did, did Nashville give over a billion dollars? Why did uh, Las Vegas give 750 million? Why did Buffalo get 850 million from the state of New York and Erie County? The only reason to answer, the only answer I have, Ross, is the 
threat, which I think is infinitesimal, the threat, they'd move. Where are the Panthers going? They're not going to St. Louis. They're not going to San Diego. They're not going to Austin. They weren't going anywhere. But that threat that there's so little, that threat that this Charlotte City Council would somehow be the people that let the Panthers leave, I think is the reason this happens. It's amazing how unpopular Tepper is and he got this money. It happens over and over again. Socialize the cost, privatize the profit. So, but we have seen team moves. The, the, the Chargers moved, the Raiders moved, the Rams moved. I mean, there have been several teams that have moved to better stadium situations just in the last 10 years. But those cities are gone. I mean, Vegas and L.A. were the, were the stalking horses. Now, we have seen owners do this privately. Obviously, Stan Kroenke built SoFi Stadium without California money. Um, and we're going to see more of that with, with when it's municipalities buck up and say we're not doing it. But the trend seems to be they'll get their money with even the ah, slightest hint. You're absolutely right. I just think with L.A. and Vegas now taken, there's nowhere to go. You got to check him out always on social media because we just have outstanding conversations. Never feels like we have enough time to chat. Uh, he's at Andrew Brandt on social media. One of the coolest guys I know. One of the most unique guys I know. Make sure, for those of you that aren't listening via the Business of Sports podcast right now, make sure you make that part of your rotation. And for those of you listening on the Business of Sports podcast, Thanks for uh, letting me have this conversation with Andrew. You probably enjoy it. It's usually Andrew talking about stuff or interviewing someone else. Hopefully you can check out the Even Money podcast, Fantasy Feast, College Draft, and, of course, the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Andrew, always great talking with you, man. Always the best, Ross. Enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Tuck's Takes. All right, Ross, the biggest news since Monday might be that both the Panthers and the Jaguars, they've gotten public funding for major stadium renovations. And I think as a result, Jack, I'm going to make this my Labatt take of the week. It's presented by Labatt Blue Light, the pristine Canadian Pilsner. Enjoy your beers together as you can live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly. Beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. I think I have three thoughts on this, right? Number one I don't think London's getting a team anytime soon because this locks Jacksonville into being in Duval County for years and years and years, and I just don't see another team that would move to London. So I don't think that that's happening anytime soon. Number two, I know a lot of people don't like it when public money goes to help build these stadiums or renovate these stadiums. I, I do think that there's some benefit to the communities, to the tax base, you know, whether it's keeping the team in town because there's probably not a great chance they'll leave, but they could. Ask Oakland, ask San Diego, ask St. Louis. They could move. So you don't want that to happen. Plus, you renovate the stadium, you get other events there, concerts, etc. There is a benefit to it. And so I'm happy. I'm happy for the Panthers. I'm happy for the Jaguars. I'm happy for their fans. And I'm glad that this is happening because I think I think it's a huge benefit to the cities in my mind. And something you discussed with Andrew, the Packers, they named Ed Policy as their new chairman and CEO. I feel like that's a good last name for like a chairman and CEO. We talked about it earlier. It's a cool job, man. I mean, I think it's probably cooler to actually be the owner, but you're kind of the owner without having to pay the money to be the owner. It's not bad. And a couple of roster moves. The Chiefs, they released defensive lineman Isaiah Bugs, Saints sign special teamer Roger Teamer, and the Browns, they cut defensive end Lonnie Phelps. Well, Lonnie Phelps and Bugs both got in trouble. So that's a really good way, if you're not a star player, to get released. Do not get arrested. That's a great way to get off the team. As for Roderick Teamer being a good special teamer, I mean, sometimes the fates just align. Sometimes things just come together. It's just unbelievable. The guy was literally born to be a good special teamer, 
And now the Saints have secured his services. I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out myfrontpagestory.com. Man, I love when people get these for their loved ones. I love seeing the smiles, the videos. So cool. I also love Pizza Boy Brewing, Sporticulture, HumanHeadNYC.com, BackOfficeScheduler.com.